Hello, Nurse NP friends. I am back with you with another video about frequently asked questions for the ICU nurse practitioner, aka more. Uh, it's the same day for me, but maybe a couple weeks later for you. We're gonna talk some more about the most common questions that I get asked by NP students when they do a rotation with the critical care team, which is who I work for. Some of these are professional, some of these are clinical, so I will put a list down below in the description, maybe somewhere here on the video, so you know whether or not this is relevant to you right now in your life. I think you will find them so. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Bree. I'm an RN, NP, mentor, interview strategist, and content creator. Welcome to the channel. Okay, let's start with an NP-related question, and that is, how did I prepare for boards? A lot of the time people are doing their ICU rotation towards the end of their program, so this is what's commonly on their mind, like, oh crap, <laughs> I'm almost done. I've only got maybe a couple hours of clinicals left and a paper, maybe a test, and I got to sit for boards, and I'm panicked, and it's natural, we have all been there. Um, here's my answer to that. I. I did a board review. I did Barclay. I did not go to the live review. Um, I think it works for some people. It depends on the kind of person you are. If you're the kind of person who likes the pressure of uh, sitting in a room full of people, getting a lot of information hammered to you um, in a short amount of time to kind of like make it all like pushed in together, this might be for you. For me, it wasn't. Um, actually, I was thinking I would do one. What happened was, what happened was, when I started my program, I don't know how it occurred to me, but I think maybe someone told me, but I got secondhand copies of the CDs um, of the Barclay Review. And as I was driving into school, because I went into school five days a week and I had to drive a bit, I would listen to the CD relevant to whatever the lecture was that day. If we were doing a section on GI, I would listen to the GI um, CD and some of it would be it'd be a little bit overload, but it was passive, right? I'd be listening to it as I was driving. I wasn't always actively engaged in like trying to memorize it, but I would hear it and I would hear it over and over and over again. So over the course of a year and a half, this stuff wasn't so foreign when I got out of school and really like then I listened to it. I took notes, I made flashcards, I started studying it like heck afterwards. I also had the little book that came with it and I wrote notes all over that thing too. So I highly advise doing some sort of board review. It doesn't have to be Barclay. Um, if you, I hear a lot of um, like non-acute care NPs, like FNPs, primary care NPs that do Fitzgerald and like that. I've heard of Leak for that. I highly, highly, highly recommend Sarah Michelle um, NP review courses. She's got some really great content for pretty much everything except for acute care out there. Um, get on some Facebook forums, get involved with some groups. I, there are a lot of groups out there. Some of these groups even will share like a question of the day and there will be a group discussion about it. If you do not have a study buddy, and I highly, highly, highly advise you get a study buddy and y'all spend a couple weeks, I spent six weeks meeting a couple times a week doing marathon days where you study. You really need someone to bounce ideas off of. One of my students gave me a fabulous idea and that I wish I had done it was, I did a lot of test bank questions. That's just how I process information. That's how I understand if I got it or not. And she would do marathon stretches, like four hours long of nothing but question after question after question and not look at the answers, just question, 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 to kind of get her body and her mind and her psyche ready for this like long stretch of time where you're gonna have to be taking um, test questions. And I wish I had done that because I, I have major test anxiety. So I had never done anything long like that. So I highly advise that. She also talked about reading all of the responses, so or um, all of the answers rationale. So even if you get the question right, you read the rationales for all of them to make sure that you got it rather than you just guessed right. So that's how I studied for boards. Uh, A common clinical question that I get is how do I choose, what presser do I choose for what? And actually this, let me back up a little bit. This isn't really the most common question I get, but it's a common follow-up question because generally speaking, when we have a patient who's in shock, I will ask the NP student what their plan is. What do you plan to do to treat this shock? And they'll say, I'm gonna add Levo and I'm gonna say, why? And they're gonna go, because that's the first choice presser. Okay, but why? <laughs> and then it follows up with how do I choose pressers? Here's my thing most people who are going to work in an ICU as a nurse practitioner have worked there as a bedside nurse. And this is, this is pattern recognition. This is experience. This is how spending time at the bedside 
sort of gives you the answer, part of the answer, but not all of the answer. And this is why, another reason why you need that foundation of time at the bedside, right? Because you have that common piece there of, okay, I know that most people tend to choose Levofed, but maybe I don't fully understand the, the, the nuances of why, and that's how you get into the medicine of it. But anyways, tangent for another day. In general, you're not gonna be wrong if you say that. Most, most types of shock will respond to Levofed, but it's not always the most ideal. So you need to understand the rationale behind what you're doing, not just the pattern of this is first choice. You don't just memorize that. Understand the rationale, understand the why, understand the pharmacodynamics, understand the side effects, understand how these medications work in order to best treat your patient, but also to be able to support your claim. If you get pimped out by your attending, if you're asked by you know somebody from another service to support why you chose this, you're gonna look like a real dummy if you just say, well, that's just what we do, or that's just protocol. But, mm -mm. That's not, that's an excuse, friends understand the drugs. These drugs are not super hard. For me, they started making sense when I started trying to understand what they do in broad classes. So these are catecholamines. They go inside the body, inside the little blood vessels and get to their target cells. They induce an effect by binding with a certain adrenergic receptor. Different receptors have different effects. And these drugs all, in some respects, hit most of these receptors but in different affinities. So if it tends to like one receptor more than the other, it'll have more of these effects and less of these effects. And that's why you'll see different side effects. For example, most people know if you put someone on an epinephrine drip, you're gonna be prone towards a little bit more ectopy, a little bit more proarrhythmic. It's more tachyarrhythmias that you may see, more so than Levofed. Why, why? Because epinephrine, tends to have more predominance towards those beta effects, beta one, one heart, more of the beta effect than it does of the alpha one effect, which is the vasoconstrictor, the pipe squeezing effect, versus levofed, which is sort of the opposite. It tends to have more of the vasoconstrictor, more of the alpha effect than it does of the beta effect, but it has both. So you're gonna have less of those tachyarrhythmias with levofed. You'll still have them, just not quite as much as epinephrine. And conversely, somebody who has you know, a sick heart, a failing heart, might like more of the, a little bit more augmented um, cardiac output, squeeze effect, pump effect from the epinephrine. So it comes down to just understanding your classifications of what they do. Now, I could spend 10 years on this video talking about presser choices, what receptors they hit, but that's not really the intent of this video. So I'm just gonna start with that, leading you into understand what your receptor sites are, how those drugs hit in different affinities, and then back into why you would pick those drugs. Now, I have made TikToks and I've made blog posts that go into great detail about this stuff if you want more details. Now, let's go back to more MP type questions. So. Again, most people are rounding with me during their close to finalization of their program. So they're thinking boards, they're also thinking job acquisition. So I get a lot of, how did you find your job? How did you get your job? How did you network? All those kind of things. Um, big, big fear for a lot of people. It was a big fear for me as well. My experience was through clinicals. I got five job offers. No, I'm sorry four job offers from clinicals and one from my workplace. So four people offered me verbal and or written offers while I was doing clinicals. Clinicals are your number one source of job acquisition. I have said that since day one, I will continue to say that. This is a working interview. In some circumstances, even if they don't have a position available, if they like you, they will either make one or they will keep you in mind for when one does come up. So always, 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 always treat your rotations as if you are interviewing for a job. Show up on time, watch the video, I'll put it up here somewhere about qualities of a great NP student. Go to clinicals and shine, friends, shine. Um, the job I actually took, I did not do a clinical rotation with them, but 
The institution that I worked for, the medical director at the time, I just went to him and I said, look, you know, do you, I'm fixing to graduate. Do you have anything coming up? And it so happened that they did. They did not have anything posted, but they were in a state of flux, as he said at that time. And they had someone who was transitioning out and I took her spot. So you never know what's happening behind the scenes. Network, get out there, ask network. I will also put a link up here now somewhere where I talk about things that you can do to acquire a job. Hey friend, are you in the market for a new or possibly even your first job? And are you frustrated by a lack of offers? If this is the case, one of two things is happening. Either the competition has better qualifications than you do, or the competition is interviewing better than you are. And guess which of these two you have control over? That's right, just yourself. You and yourself. You only have control over what you do in life. Now, what I find is that most nurses and NPs were never taught how to interview, nor have they researched how to do it. We need to take a number from our friends at the School of Business who know how to sell themselves. We can do it too. I help people by offering mock interviews where they get to practice their skills, and I also offer an on-demand digital course that is 19 videos totaling three hours and nine PDFs. It's gonna walk you through start to finish how to get ready for and deliver the performance of your career. It is going to be the most lucrative investment you could possibly make for the entirety of your career. The return on investment is phenomenal. Y'all, I've been doing mock interviews for a year. I am extremely proud to tell you that I have a 100% success rate within two months, and that's really only because of one outlier. Everyone has gotten a job offer, and it brings me such joy to know that people are landing their dream jobs. I'm not talking even like the second option. They're landing their dream jobs, people. There is a way to perfect this skill and you really have to invest in it. I know you're tired of studying, but it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of preparation. You will alleviate a lot of the nerves and fears and you'll be able to show your personality and they will be wanting to offer you a job before you even leave the room. I can't tell you how many of my clients have told me they have heard those words. So if you're in the market for some help, please go check out my website at breemp.com to either schedule a mock interview or look into the digital course if that's right for you. Thanks for listening and thanks so much for watching my videos. Okay, let's do one more clinical question. That's probably all we'll have time for in this video. And this one is gonna be, how did I learn to read chest x-rays? How did I learn to read chest x-rays? I think I asked this too. This is another subject that's like, when you're in school, it's, it's just so foreign. When you're working as a nurse, you're not fully used to interpreting them, maybe a little bit. You can look at a pair of lungs on an x-ray and go, ooh, that looks bad or it looks good, right? You can kind of do that. But getting to the nuance, how to use the nomenclature, how to use the words, how to describe what you're seeing and appropriately diagnose the problem, that just takes time. I remember being in my program and sitting through, the, we had, I wanna say like three or four lectures on films. We had a radiologist come and teach one. Um, my director taught some specifically on chest x-rays. I say chest x-rays rather than any other kind of film because that's the one I'm reading every single day on every single patient. Now, there are a lot of other films, a lot of other studies you need to be able to interpret, but this is the one that we commonly do in ICU, so this is why I'm asked that a lot. Um, I remember being very overwhelmed in these <laughs> lectures. Uh, you know, people will start from a very um, objective approach, A, B, C, D, you know, airway, what do the bones look like? What does the cardiac silhouette look like? And, and doing things systematically. And I think that when you're new and you're learning, that's probably the right way to do it. But um, in practice, right now, that's, that's not how I do it. Um, to me, this is a very right brain kind of thing. It, it's, 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 it's more of a pattern recognition thing and it just takes time. I teach new and onboarding NPs that we just go through them. We just go through them. Every single patient you have that day, bring your x-ray here, let's look at it together and let's go through what do you see. You're looking at, you're not just looking at lung parenchyma, you're looking at the pleural space, you're looking at the airways, you're looking at that cardiac silhouette, you're looking at the diaphragm, you're looking at the rib spacing. There's a lot to it. And obviously I can't talk about that in depth in this video either, or it would be 10 years long too, but just know that everybody when they are new, particularly in the ICU, is in this exact same space of looking at it and going, well, I know it's bad, but I can't tell you what's bad about it. Um, 
with time this will get better you've got to find a mentor you've got to find someone that is good at this that is willing to help you through it and just do it over and over and over again the other thing i would do is anytime that i saw a really good radiologist note or a really good physician note in association with a film i would just compare them okay he says there's atelectasis in the left and here's why and i would look at it and say hmm, okay and then i would go home and watch a bunch of videos on atelectasis and read a bunch of articles on atelectasis and just slowly garner some knowledge about what it looks like, what to do for it, the management of it. So that's how you piece it all together. Okay, four more frequently asked questions for you there. I'm sorry I'm not getting to these faster. I just have a lot of words to say, and I know you need to hear them all. We will keep on with this series if you like it, and um, let me know if you have any questions that you want me to add to this list.